Hi, I'm Dr. Julia Wood. I'm a psychiatrist in private practice in Knoxville, Tennessee. I completed my residency training at Harvard's combined Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital residency program. And in my final year of training, I worked with the perinatal psychiatry group. Since residency, I've continued to focus on treating mood and anxiety disorders in women in pregnancy and the postpartum period. I'm also a volunteer with the Tennessee chapter of Postpartum Support International. When I gave birth to my first child, I was a resident in Boston and I delivered at Massachusetts General Hospital and stayed for several days in a room overlooking the Charles River. What I remember most about my stay is my bedside nurse. I was assigned the same nurse for the duration of my stay, and she basically gave me a crash course in how to be a mom. She gave me small elevator pitches on various subjects. She taught me how to bathe my son, how to care for his umbilical cord site, how to swaddle, how to nurse, and she showed me nursing positions, breast care, what to expect in regards to his feeding and his diapers and his sleep, and she gave me a talk on postpartum depression. She told me what was normal and what should cause me more concern and how to reach out for help. It was all so beautifully done and I remember it well, 11 years later. Today, in addition to giving you some tips on treating postpartum mood and anxiety disorders, I hope to inspire you to develop an elevator pitch about postpartum depression if you don't already have one. It should be just one or two minutes long and it should be something you can tell to women during prenatal visits, at hospital discharge, and in postpartum appointments. It should include information on what's normal, the baby blues, and what needs more attention and treatment. It should also include how to get help. And listen, I know you are busy people, and I know you may already have more on your plate than one person should be asked to handle. I wouldn't ask this of you if, it, if I didn't think it could make a lasting difference on the mother-child dyad that you help usher into the world. Do you know what an ACE score is? ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And the ACE questionnaire is a 10-point questionnaire that asks about childhood experiences, such as parental divorce, physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, and neglect. The higher one scores on the ACE questionnaire, the more likely one will have problems in adulthood, such as depression, alcohol, drug, or tobacco misuse, and chronic health conditions, including obesity and cardiovascular disease. Two of the questions on the ACE questionnaire relate to parental substance use disorder or mental health problems. When a baby comes into the world, she relies on a caregiver for further brain development. The first three years of life are the most rapid growth for the brain. And so it is crucial for parents to be as well and as engaged with their children as possible. I would argue that by treating maternal depression, we have a ripple effect for a lifetime on the overall health of a child. Maternal mental health problems, including substance use disorders, are also a major contributor to maternal mortality. Substance use disorders contributed to one in three pregnancy-associated deaths in 2017 and 2018, and mental health problems contributed to one in four deaths. Treating or preventing maternal depression is all the more important because it is so common. One in five women report having a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder. If you're in a busy OB clinic seeing 20 women in a day and you give each of those women your elevator pitch on postpartum depression, four of those 20 women can benefit from that information. That is a big return on your investment. As I provide you with information on perinatal mood and anxiety disorders today, I will also provide you with resources that you can use or share with your patients. Again, I'm asking you to implement some new practices, but I am not asking you to do this alone or without support. Many of the resources I will share today come from Postpartum Support International, or PSI, and its mission is to promote awareness, prevention, and treatment of mental health issues related to childbearing. PSI started in 1987, and its mission is to promote awareness, prevention, and treatment of mental health issues related to childbearing. PSI started as a helpline for new mothers, and it has grown into an international organization which offers education, 
peer support, and a helpline for new parents. What I hope to teach you today is first, how to identify risk factors and to screen for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Second, how to diagnose and treat perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And third, we will come back to our elevator pitch so you can make sure that you're ready to give your pitch to patients and offer them resources. How do we identify the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, their risk factors and screening? What are the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or PMADs as we often refer to them? Postpartum depression is the most common of the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and it can overlap with other anxiety disorders. In fact, often anxiety is the most pervasive symptom of postpartum depression. Women may not identify with feeling sad or depressed, but they can't enjoy themselves due to high anxiety. It's important to differentiate the baby blues from postpartum depression. So let's talk for a moment about how they differ. So the baby blues is common. Up to 80% of women will experience it. I tell my patients who are pregnant what to expect. In the first week or so after delivery, you may feel weepier, move to tears, you may have times of feeling anxious, and these feelings, they can feel pretty intense, but they're relatively short-lived. So between times of feeling weepy and anxious, you can still bond with your baby, bond with your partner. You should be able to sleep when the baby sleeps, between feeds overnight, or if you have someone watching the baby for some time in the day, you should be able to lie down and rest without great difficulty. And the symptoms get better around day seven to 10 postpartum. In postpartum depression, on the other hand, women have high anxiety that is more pervasive. When baby sleeps, mom is often lying awake, anxious, unable to rest. She may lose a lot of weight fairly quickly due to loss of appetite. Her energy may be very low. She may be struggling to get out of bed or do what she needs to do to care for her children. Or she may feel tired but wired, exhausted but unable to relax. She may feel she can't bond with her baby. She may feel disconnected. She may feel really guilty about this, like a bad mom. And she may even feel that others, including her family, would be better off if she weren't around. So again, the baby blues are self-limited, less pervasive, and don't require intervention. Postpartum depression, on the other hand, is more pervasive, severe, and longer lasting. And we need to identify and provide treatment for this. Obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD is characterized by obsessions or compulsions. Obsessions are unwanted and intrusive worries, thoughts, or images, and compulsions are behaviors that an individual engages in to get rid of the obsessions or to reduce distress. Obsessive compulsive disorder is up to five times more common in the postpartum period. Obsessive compulsive disorder is characterized by obsessions or compulsions. Obsessions are unwanted and intrusive worries, thoughts, or images, and compulsions are behaviors that an individual engages in to get rid of obsessions or reduce distress. Obsessive compulsive disorder is up to five times more common in the postpartum period than at any other time in a woman's life. In postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, Obsessions often manifest as intrusive worries about harm befalling baby. Mom may fear her baby may be injured, is not receiving enough food, suddenly may stop breathing, and mom can have a fear of herself harming the baby and may see images of herself throwing the baby, dropping the baby, or inappropriately touching the baby. These experiences tend to be extremely distressing to mom. Compulsions may or may not be present. The intrusive images and worries can be so upsetting that some mothers may not want to be around baby for fear of harming her. However, it should be noted that mothers with OCD who have intrusive images of harming their babies are not actually at risk of harming them. Mothers with OCD should not be separated from baby due to fear that they may harm them. Panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder are both anxiety disorders that have high comorbidity with depression. Panic disorder is characterized by panic attacks that come on out of the blue and often result in a woman avoiding situations 
due to fear of having another panic attack. Generalized anxiety disorder is more generalized worry with difficulty sleeping, loss of appetite, tense muscles, and other physical symptoms. So again, both panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder can overlap with depression in the postpartum period. Postpartum psychosis is rare, but it is an emergency and requires urgent evaluation and treatment. Postpartum psychosis is characterized by delusions, often paranoia or hallucinations, and a decreased need for sleep. Sometimes women will appear confused or have difficulty communicating. The risk of suicide and infanticide is increased in postpartum psychosis. There's a 5% suicide rate and a 4% infanticide rate. So while the majority of women experiencing postpartum psychosis do not harm themselves or anyone else, the elevated risk requires swift action to get women the help they need. Women with a history of bipolar disorder are at the highest risk for postpartum psychosis. I counsel all of my patients with a history of bipolar disorder about this risk and have a plan with each of them to either continue medication during pregnancy or resume it quickly postpartum. I additionally counsel all of my patients with a history of bipolar disorder to prioritize sleep in the postpartum period. I ask them to work with a partner to ensure at least a six hour chunk of rest because it is so important in preventing a mood episode. As a psychiatrist with additional training in perinatal mental health, I feel what I have to offer women is specialized training and understanding about medication during pregnancy and lactation so that I can then help guide treatment decisions that take into account both mom and baby. However, what I find in reality is that women seek me out because they feel I will understand them. There is never a good time to be depressed or anxious, but experiencing these symptoms postpartum or during pregnancy, when you're supposed to be finding joy in a new baby and caring for another human being, it is an especially hard time to be depressed. Women describe feeling so alone. They want someone to listen, understand and walk alongside them through the journey. I think that most of us were called to medicine for this reason, to ease pain and suffering, to walk alongside another person and to help ease their load. I want to stress that you do not need to have all the answers to help your patients. You need to know when to worry and how to get help when you're worried. The mantra in my residency program was never worry alone. With some planning ahead and with some resources, I believe you can avoid worrying alone. While I advocate talking to all women about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, let's talk about who's at most risk. First, women with a history of depression. Pay particular attention to whether someone was on medication prior to pregnancy and stopped to become pregnant. Women who are on an antidepressant and stop for pregnancy have a 50% chance of relapsing into a depressive episode during pregnancy. Number two, depression during pregnancy. This is the number one risk factor for postpartum depression. While we want to be thoughtful about exposing baby to medication, it is important to treat depression during pregnancy. Most studies of antidepressant medication during pregnancy suggest that when one controls for maternal depression, the risk of medication all but disappears. Basically, maternal depression is the risk factor for the negative outcomes for baby, such as small for gestational age or preterm delivery. Treating with medication can help mom feel better during pregnancy and can reduce her risk for postpartum depression. Substance use disorders increase the risk of depression. Opioid use disorder is the deadliest illness in psychiatry. We want to be addressing this aggressively in conjunction with mental health. We want to take the opportunity during pregnancy when women are connected to care to help them plan for the postpartum period, as this is a time of high risk for relapse, relapse of addiction or of mental health problems. A traumatic event during pregnancy increases your risk of postpartum depression. And of course, the pandemic has been a time of increased hardship, loss and trauma for many. Poor social support is also a risk factor. And a little later in the lecture, I'll introduce you to some peer support resources that you can share with your patients. In talking about racial disparities in maternal mental health, it's important to note that like in other areas of medicine, race is not the reason for the disparities in care, meaning 
that it is systemic racism and implicit bias that increases the risk of poor health outcomes among women of color. Implicit bias refers to unconscious attitudes or stereotypes that affect our actions and decisions. Even well-meaning people have implicit bias. One of the more memorable examples of implicit bias in my own life occurred during medical school. I was on my surgery rotation. I was called to scrub in for an emergency case overnight. And I went to the OR, I scrubbed my hands clean, I walked into the OR where I was helped into my gown and my gloves, and I was left with my gown untied. And I needed somebody to tie it for me. So I looked around the room and saw a woman sitting at a computer. She looked less busy than anyone else in the room. And so I assumed she must be one of the OR techs. I interrupted her and I asked her to tie my gown. Imagine my horror when the case started and she was the attending surgeon. I was mortified. Even as a woman myself, I assumed that this woman in the room was not the surgeon and it is implicit bias that causes this mental leap. It's important to recognize it in ourselves when we see it. Studies of racial disparity in the field of perinatal mental health show that women of color are less likely to receive screening for postpartum depression. Studies also suggest that women of color have higher rates of postpartum depression than non-Hispanic white women. And women of color with postpartum depression are less likely to receive treatment, even when they screen positive for postpartum depression, and are less likely to follow through with filling a prescription for antidepressants. Studies investigating attitudes towards mental illness in the African-American community have found that while many individuals express positive attitudes towards seeking mental health services, this does not translate into actually seeking treatment. There's also literature that suggests a higher use of religious coping with depression in the African-American community than in, than in the Caucasian community. It is of course important to be aware that our patients, no matter their racial or ethnic background, may have preferences about treatment. We should spend a little bit of time exploring these preferences and making sure we are addressing them. In depression, moderate to severe illness should be treated with both medication and psychotherapy, whereas milder illness may respond just as well to psychotherapy alone. It's important to explain to our patients why we are recommending one treatment or another or why we think both are important. Peer support is best delivered in a mode that allows for women to be with a group of people they identify with. Postpartum Support International has online groups specifically geared to women of different situations and cultures. For example, there are groups for black mothers, NICU parents, South Asian mothers, fathers, queer parents, and more. And for the time being, these groups are all online and they can be found on the Postpartum Support International website, which is postpartum.net. You can also simply Google Postpartum Support International and find the website. All women should be screened for postpartum depression at six weeks postpartum and also during pregnancy and two weeks postpartum for women at high risk. An illness that is common and treatable lends itself to screening. Postpartum depression hits both of these marks. The most commonly used tool to screen for postpartum depression is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale or the EPDS. The EPDS has questions that are more specific to the postpartum period and is free to use. A positive screen is considered equal to or greater than 13. A score over 13 or an affirmative answer to the question about suicidal thoughts should be passed on to the medical provider for further discussion. The EPDS is a screening tool, which of course means a score of 13 on the EPDS needs further questioning, but this doesn't make a diagnosis of depression. Depression is diagnosed when someone has either depressed mood or loss of interest in activities, and then three or four more symptoms of depression. SIG ECAPS is the mnemonic that we use to remember the symptoms of depression. S, changes in sleep. I, loss of interest in activities. G, guilty ruminations. E, changes in energy. C, concentration difficulties or difficulty making decisions. A, changes in appetite, P, psychomotor retardation or agitation, and S, suicidal thoughts. 
Oftentimes, when I'm talking to people about screening for postpartum depression, the thing that understandably frightens people the most is, what if someone answers yes to the last question on the EPDS, the question about suicidal thoughts? Before you ask the question, make sure you have a plan in place to address this. And that plan can and really should include more than simply the question, should I hospitalize this person or can I send them home? Ideally, you'd have someone in the office with some additional training in mental health treatment and risk assessment. Sometimes a mother may need to be hospitalized or sent to the emergency room for further evaluation. However, if this is not the appropriate decision, simply sending someone home with a follow-up appointment or a phone number for a therapist is not ideal. The National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention has numerous resources on their website, including trainings on this subject and tools that you can use and I encourage you to check their website out. If you've assessed someone and are sending them home with outpatient follow-up, you want to do some safety planning and lethal means reduction. This includes providing the patient with resources, including crisis telephone numbers, such as a suicide hotline, and helping her engage her own social support network. You want to help her think about who she can reach out to if she needs more support. Lethal means reduction means talking about access to firearms or lethal drugs and how to secure things at home and restrict access. The restriction of access can be discussed as temporary during this time of increased risk, and it should involve family members or friends. Firearms can be given to a family member or friend for safekeeping or locked in a way that the patient cannot access them. If you're worried about a patient, you should ideally have a system that allows someone in the office to call her in the days after her visit and a way to ensure she makes it to a follow-up appointment that you had recommended. So now that we know what PMADs are and how to identify them, let's move on to treatment. I'd like to give you a few practical tips on treatment with medication. First, please be comfortable with at least two or three first-line medications for depression. Postpartum depression, I most commonly use sertraline and escitalopram. I choose sertraline first in a medication-naive woman due to low passage into the breast milk. If someone has previously tried and failed sertraline, I choose escitalopram. With both medications, I start with half of the typical starting dose, which is 25 milligrams for sertraline and five milligrams for escitalopram. I tell women to take this dose for six days and then, if they don't have side effects, increase to 50 milligrams of sertraline or 10 milligrams of escitalopram. When starting medication, I tell patients that the most common side effects are nausea and diarrhea. I also tell them that some people who run anxious can initially feel more anxious with these medications. I tell them that starting low does reduce that risk. And I also tell them that at the end of the six days, if they're still having some initial side effects, they can wait a few more days to increase the medicine. So again, I start low, but I don't stay low. I try to quickly get women to a therapeutic dose and then wait a few weeks to see if this helps. If you have a patient with postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder, the SSRIs are also first line and sertraline or escitalopram would be my first choice once again. A couple of tips in treating OCD. First, OCD symptoms often respond to higher doses of medication than depression or other anxiety disorders. For this reason, I might be a bit more aggressive with dosing to target OCD. Additionally, a specific therapy called exposure and response prevention can be incredibly helpful in the treatment of OCD. The black box warning. All antidepressants carry a black box warning about new suicidal thoughts emerging with treatment, and you need to know about this. The black box warning only applies to people under the age of 25 years old. In adults 25 and older, the incidence of suicidal thoughts was the same in people on active medication and placebo. In studies of antidepressants in children, adolescents, and young adults, the incidence of suicidal thoughts was double in those on medication versus placebo. We don't know why this is, but we need to tell patients about this. We need to do so in a calm manner so as not to create panic. I tell patients that there's a warning on these antidepressants for people under the age of 25 years old. I say, 
There's something about the developing brain that can cause medication to interact differently in people under the age of 25 years old. In large studies, researchers found that young adults taking medication were more likely to have thoughts of suicide than young adults taking placebo or a sugar pill. It was very rare for anyone to have suicidal thoughts in these studies, just two to 4% of people. But the risk was increased for people taking medication. So what about bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder is important to identify in your patients as women with a history of bipolar disorder have an increased risk for postpartum psychosis, and they have a very high risk for postpartum depression. However, the challenge that I find in treating patients is that so many people come to me having been diagnosed with bipolar disorder at some point in time, and it can be hard sometimes to tease out who truly has bipolar disorder and who does not. And I certainly don't expect you to tease out this diagnosis yourself, but I want to give you a few tips that may allow you to know who to really be worried about. Women with bipolar one disorder have a history of manic episodes with several days of little to no sleep, high energy and unusual behavior. Often these women will have symptoms of psychosis when manic. Hints of bipolar one disorder include a history of hospitalization or treatment with lithium. These women, if they have stopped medication for pregnancy, need to be counseled on what to look out for postpartum in terms of symptoms of mania. Ideally, they'd meet with a psychiatrist to have a good plan in place postpartum to prevent any kind of psychiatric complication. Bipolar II disorder is harder to tease out. These women have had episodes of hypomania with times of needing less sleep, irritability, they may have gotten themselves into trouble with out of control behavior, but when these symptoms intersect with times of substance misuse, it gets very murky. If you're meeting with someone in the postpartum period with a history of bipolar disorder, who's currently depressed and does not have any of the big red flags for bipolar one disorder, I simply encourage you to get curious and ask a few more questions. Consider whether the symptoms occurred in the context of substance misuse. Specifically, I would ask how long she's been off psychiatric medication and if there were any medications she took in the past that were helpful. I would also ask about what happened when she took SSRIs. If the answer is simply, I don't remember, or well, they didn't help, but they didn't cause problems, and your patient has a history of substance misuse and trauma, you may do well to try a low dose of an SSRI while you get her in to see a psychiatrist. If a psychiatry appointment is four weeks away, it really would be nice to get your patient started on something to help her feel better more quickly. Someone needs to prescribe medication. I put this in here as a reminder. We need to do what is best for the patient. And that might mean trying to get her a sooner appointment with a psychiatrist, or it could mean prescribing medication yourself. I find it heartbreaking meeting a woman who's had a relapse of depression after being taken off medication early in pregnancy because she simply thought it was unsafe or impossible to continue medication during pregnancy. There are times where neither the primary care physician, obstetrician, or even the psychiatrist want to be the one to continue a medication during pregnancy. It's important to keep in mind that medication during pregnancy is weighed against the risk of untreated illness during pregnancy. And as you may remember me saying earlier in the talk, many of the risks associated with medication have been found to be associated with underlying illness. The medications we prescribe to treat depression are often low risk. But again, I'm not asking you to do this alone. If a woman tells you about a medication she took previously that was so helpful and now she wants to restart it, only you're not familiar with it and she's pregnant or she's breastfeeding, one resource available to you is the provider consultation line. Postpartum Support International has a free telephone consult service for all prescribing clinicians. You can call this number and register online and have a telephone discussion with a perinatal psychiatrist. It's not a hotline, so you may need to wait a day or two to talk to someone, but I really encourage you to take advantage of this free resource. And of course, medication is just one possible treatment. Let's touch on some other helpful things that we can share with our patients. I always prescribe sleep. Improving sleep improves depression, even outside the postpartum period. 
I therefore tell new moms with PMADS to find a four to six hour chunk of time when they can have uninterrupted sleep. This may mean they pump right before bed so someone else can provide a bottle. For moms who are having a lot of trouble sleeping due to anxiety, and I don't have active concerns about substance misuse, I prescribe a low dose of lorazepam to help with sleep while the SSRI is getting on board. Therapy, of course, is another evidence-based treatment. Both cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy are specific modalities of psychotherapy that have been studied in the treatment of postpartum depression. Some women may achieve remission of symptoms with therapy alone, and others with moderate to severe depression will need a combination of therapy and medication. Connecting women with a therapist with experience treating new moms and families is ideal, and Postpartum Support International has a helpline that patients can call to connect with someone who can point them to therapists in their area with additional experience. Peer support groups can also be helpful for women with postpartum depression. Currently, online, there are national groups, and women can sign up for these on the PSI website. PSI also has a helpline. This helpline is staffed by volunteers, many of whom have lived experience with postpartum depression. They can lend a kind ear, share information on peer support groups, local therapists, and psychiatrists who specialize in treating postpartum depression. What I hope you take away from this talk today, more than anything, is the following. We should be working hard to prevent depression during pregnancy, as this is the biggest risk factor for postpartum depression. For some women, this may mean continuing medication during pregnancy. We should be talking to women about postpartum mood and anxiety disorders before delivery so they know what to look out for and how to get help. This is your elevator pitch. Craft it and practice it so that it can be delivered easily and often. Remember, talk about the baby blues. The transient symptoms can be normal. Talk about postpartum depression, that more severe Pervasive symptoms need treatment. And provide your patients with information on Postpartum Support International and our helpline, as well as how to reach you if that's appropriate. And never worry alone. Please use the resources I shared today and make sure you have community partners that you can reach out to for help. If you want to learn more about training opportunities with Postpartum Support International or how to get involved, you can go to the PSI website or you can email me. We are always looking for more volunteers and partners in this work, and I'm happy to talk more with any of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. I hope that these resources and information are helpful for both you and your patients.